Salam alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you all for joining us on day five of FinTech Tour 20, uh, the largest cluster of FinTech events in the Middle East. Uh, my name is Sagar Shah and I'm part of FinTech Saudi. Uh, we have a great evening session for you this evening on what will banking look like in 2050. But we know it is a Thursday evening. We know that the weather outside is lovely. And so we really appreciate your time in joining us here today. We want this to be a fun, lighthearted, interactive session. Um, so feel free to add any comments in the chat box, add any questions you have in the Q&A. We've got four outstanding people uh, as part of this discussion today. Mike Cunningham, unfortunately, sends his apologies that he's not able to join, but we still have a stellar group here. We've got Grant Niven, head of group head of digital at BSF. Uh, ben Lloyd, head of digital products at BSF. Abdul Rahman Ahmed, a senior strategy manager at BSF. And a very special guest, Simon Taylor, who's head of ventures at 11FS. Thank you all for joining uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Okay. Sagar, shall I kick off? Yeah, please do. Excellent. So good evening, everyone. Um, it's an absolute delight to be here. Uh, my name's Grant. I'll be your moderator this evening for this hour session. We're going to um, make this as interactive and as fun as we can um, for a Thursday night. We know you've all had a busy week and we'll be clocking off from work. So the topic of the future of banking 2050 was all about the future. Um, and, and ultimately for us, we wanna make this a, a really engaging conversation. In terms of the format, um, we're gonna just do some inter introductions around the panel briefly, just so you get a feel for everyone. And there's a lot of great experience on this group. Um, I'll do a quick playback. Um, I'm a huge fan of Back to the Future and, and the, the whole theme of looking into the past to actually predict what's gonna happen in the future is something we'll do just for five minutes. Then we'll get into a roundtable discussion around a couple of themes that will hopefully be really engaging for you all. So first of all, we'll just go around the panels, um, the, the, the panel group, that everyone just going to give a little flavor as to who they are, their background. So um, our guest um, who's joined us, so I, I head up Group Digital um, for, for BSF, and um, Ben and Abdul Rahman, both are my fellow colleagues. But So I'll hand over first to Simon, um, Simon Taylor, who's very kindly joined us as a guest speaker from the UK. So Simon, over to you, and then we'll go around the rest of the group. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Simon Taylor, I'm one of the founders of a company called 11FS, 11FS.com. Uh, we are a challenger consultancy. We help organizations transform and become much more digital, beautiful butterflies versions of themselves. Uh, we also run the FinTech Insider podcast, um, and my co-founder, Jason Bates, was one of the founders of both Monzo and Starling. Uh, I am a glorified FinTech nerd and absolutely love the subject, so I'm super happy to be speaking about FinTech today. Um, and I was head of blockchain research and development for Barclays. Um, before that, I built out their innovation platform called Barclays Rice. So hopefully, lots of relevant stuff. Thanks, Thank Simon. Thank you. So I'm Ben, I work with Grant and Abdul Rahman at um, BSF and, and thank you to FinTech Saudi for allowing us the opportunity for I think the third year um, to do one of the headline discussions. Um, I think this is one of the more exciting topics. Um, so I, I've been at BSF and, and my role is um, head of digital product. Um, so trying to create all that's new and good in digital um, within BSF. Before that, um, I've had a journey uh, building FinTechs um, across RegTech, InvestTech, um, in sure tech um, through you know multiple fundraising rounds um, and in my spare time um, I'm an advisor to a, a fintech focused venture capital business um, called 1818 venture capital um, so you know I'm very excited for uh, uh, this discussion um, so that we can try and make some big predictions about the future of banking thank you Ben and uh, hello everyone thank you also for having me my name is Abdurrahman Ahmed I'm a senior strategy manager with BSF, joined earlier this year, essentially right before COVID. So uh, I uh, previously, uh, I was a management consultant and uh, the reason I joined banking was to try to find a more stable job, you know, uh, predictable work hours and, you know, uh, just a, a nice work-life balance. But uh, I believe uh, COVID had other uh, plans and uh, this ended up being one of the craziest, but also most exciting years uh, of my career. Uh, so before joining, I was, uh, as I said, working in management consulting, did a lot of projects with both public sector entities and a lot of uh, venture capital, private equity. Whoops. Apologies for that. I think I got disconnected. Private equity and uh, sovereign wealth funds. 
And uh, now I'm helping BSF, you know, really realize their strategy, come up with new ways of thinking and really challenge the way we do work uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you again for having me. Thank you. And we've also got a, a surprise guest. I believe, Saga, you're going to hang on with us all as part of the panel um, and, and we'll get you involved in the debate. So delighted to have you and get your perspective. I know you're a futurologist. You love, <laughs> love looking into the future. So this is right up your street. Thank you. Okay, great. Look, the first thing I want to do is just spend a few minutes doing a reflection on the last 30 years. Because I think in doing that, it's going to just give us a flavor for what's happened both in the industry, what's happened more broadly in the world over a 30 year period, which really gives us a flavor for the stretch we're going to go for as part of this panel in terms of what, what we believe may happen looking into our crystal balls into the next 30 years. And just going by 2020, um, I think none of us could have predicted what's happened with COVID, what's happened with the world, how the world's responding to it. So we're, we're certainly living in very volatile times. But if I just play back to 1980, um, if you look at the banking industry, um, I'm going to give you a, a, a running order of different events, technologies, and um, situations that have kind of come about, just to give us a flavor as to what, what's happened over that time scale. So back in 1980, there was the invent, invention of the electronic cash counters. Um, which goes to show back at that point in time, physical cash and counting cash was obviously a high priority. That was a big innovation. It was also the foundation of telephone banking. Um, so the first banks that were starting to offer that innovation in the industry started to come through. We then had tablet computers in 1989. Um, it was actually Samsung with one of the first to provide that capability. And it was advertised as um, the banks taking the branch to their customers when they went in. Um, probably green screens and it's not a great deal on them, but it was an innovation that, that certainly got a few people interested. We then saw the rise in, in the, the late 1990s, 97 of internet banking. Um, I personally remember as a young guy coming out of university, um, going into sort of late 1990s, speaking to a very senior technology leader in one of the banks I was working with, who told me that internet banking wasn't taking off, didn't believe in it. And typically a lot of people were still going to branches and it was all a, a lot of hype. And, and we look now as to what's happened. It's um, dramatically changed. Um, 1998, we had PayPal, um, um, an upstart, and right up Simon, your street in terms of a tech company coming in to solve problems with, with easy user interfaces and a simple solution for, for what ultimately now has become a global powerhouse. I think the market cap of PayPal is sitting about $214 billion. And I think that's a, a good point we'll come back to as part of this discussion. Um, innovation comes in, in often the most simplest ideas and just doing them very well, giving a great user experience. Um, moving on from that, um, early early two, 2000s, we saw things like digital check clearing, um, trying to move away from paper-based checks. And, and we still live in a world of paper checks and still haven't got rid of that, but actually been able to clear checks and, and get more economies of scale was, was a big innovation. 2007, we saw the iPhone come out. Um, we also saw the murmurings of the financial crash, um, but ultimately um, that led to two kind of key events, both Apple emerging and getting the smartphone into the hands of millions of people, um, and then lots of other kind of smartphone providers coming out behind them. But also we started to see the first kind of beginnings of a new wave of technology, which innovating the banking industry. Um, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, um, for those who invested back in 2009, um, did very well um, and probably probably not sitting looking at a podcast and relaxing on a beach somewhere. Um, contactless payments um, sort of started rising and becoming more prevalent in the late 2000s. Um, and then we started seeing the mobile pause device coming in. So being able to actually pay um, pay a merchant in a, in a, a remote location, in a garage, et cetera, in the, in the mid 2000s. So 2010 even. Um, financial recognition technology, um, we, we also start to see more tech going into physical cards with the EMV, cheap, uh, EMV, EMV chip. And then we've got the, the kind of push around encryption and tokenization to, to ultimately the stage we're at now, where we've seen fintech, and this is going to be a big topic for discussion today, starting to really go into the mass market. Um, the innovation they're bringing, the experience they're bringing is, is certainly disrupting the industry. It's not overtaking the banking sector yet, but I think for this debate, we'll, we'll discuss whether we believe it could do. Um, we've seen tokenization, encryption um, coming into the fold, really extending the technology such as blockchain into an industrial um, 
sort of use case that can be used across the industry. Data science is becoming much more prevalent in terms of harnessing that knowledge from data. And I think that's a theme which um, we're already seeing a lot of industries, including banking, making huge strides in. But I think going into the future is going to be a significant game changer. And we're actually starting to see huge kind of traction in terms of a lot of people wanting to use their mobile phones for all their experiences with their banks, certainly in the retail space. But it's also kind of progressing into the SME market. Corporates are looking to do a lot more in that, in that domain in terms of digital um, versus going to a branch. So all these technologies are driving change. Um, business models are changing. Um, post the financial crash, we've seen the, the economy stat and the banking sector um, remain incredibly resilient um, um, through a lot of the financial um, measures that were put in place post-2008 in terms of regulation and liquidity. So we've, we've had a lot of learnings. But over that period, over that 30-year period, huge amount of innovation. And I think going forward, just to kind of leave the panelists with some food for thought, maybe to feed into the discussion, I see kind of four clear themes um, in terms of what the future will look like. So the future of banking will be invisible. Um, is one theme I want to put out there. Um, we're going to start, to, the, the, the lines are going to start going to merge between banks and other industries. Um, we're going to see much more connectedness um, in the banking sector. So the second theme around ecosystems of providers coming together. Um, it's going to be insight driven um, and data science is obviously one element to that. But providing rich insights will allow us to provide much better personalized services to our customers and, and, and to our large corporates and various different other segments. And it's going to be purposeful. Um, so we're going to align with people's social social ambitions. We're going to look at the environmental impact that's happening. Um, and some of the questions we, we, I'll table as well around sustainability and, and actually people being much more conscious about how they're investing their money as well. So big changes happening, um, a lot going on in the industry and a, and a lot still to come. So, so initial food for thought. So I'm going to turn it over to some open discussion now. And I think the first thing for me, and I think with Simon here, I was keen to get this out right at the start, um, and a question around the banking industry and ultimately fintechs overtaking the current banks. So I guess, Simon, this is a topic I'm going to throw at you first, but I know the others in the panel. Do we think by 2050 that the traditional banks are going to be overtaken by fintechs with new innovations and ideas? Yes, it's already happened. Um, it's, it's here in 2020. Uh, PayPal is bigger than all but about three banks in the US. Um, now, when people say fintech, quite often what they think is, oh, you mean that small digital company that's appeared? It's like, well, that was PayPal in 1998, but fast forward 22 years and a lot can happen in that period of time. So uh, the banks haven't disappeared, but also look at their growth in the US uh, or lack thereof. Their revenue growth has been in a good year in the five to six percent range, and their uh, profitability growth has been zero to to one percent. Uh, so, like the real growth in the banking industry isn't in banks anymore. It's either moved into the shadow banking sector, or it's ha it's coming from somewhere else, from things that are not banks. So, fintech is already bigger in some markets like the U.S. and in some markets like Europe as well. You already see Klarna valued at eleven billion dollars revenue uh, revolut valued at $10 billion. These are meaty organizations already in their own right. Um, and they're bigger than some of the, the regional banks that you see around the world. So uh, I think it's not a case of will it happen by 2050. It's a case of uh, how soon till it's the case everywhere. So Simon, I, I agree with you. And, and that's definitely what the data is showing. Um, but I think the, the kind of clear trend, you know, you look at PayPal, you look at Adyen, you look at Klarna. Um, largely, these are kind of payment businesses that are overtaking traditional banks. And I think you know, have fintechs overtaken or will, will fintechs, fintechs overtake traditional banks? Um, it's really about, you know, at a product level, um, do we think they will? So in terms of payment technology, I think that's absolutely what we're seeing. And, you know, I, I couldn't believe, Grant, when you said in your intro that PayPal um, was born in the 90s. I, can you believe it? Because we still think of it, or I still think of it as an innovative, modern fintech company. I can't believe, you know, it's almost um, as old as I am. Um, but I think if you look at, you know, deposit taking fintechs, um, for the deposit taking fintechs, I think there's going to be um, a bit more of a challenge. Um, and, you know, and that's what we've seen in the utilization or the adoption of 
um, some of the other, you know, deposit taking uh, neo banks um, around the world, you know, they're still taking a lot longer. And I think that's because, you know, ultimately banking does need to change. Um, the whole industry um, is facing, you know, the moment where it has to be reinvented, rebirthed. Um, but actually, there's still a lot of trust that resides in that system. You know, even after the financial crisis, um, when trust in banks couldn't get any lower, and there were still a few alternatives. And you know, this is what creates the opportunity for deposit taking fintechs to exist. Um, yet the customer behaviour um, is such that I think it's going to take a lot longer. Um, for um, fintechs to overtake banks. And I think within that period as well, uh, you know, to get the, the perspective of others, what a bank is will also change. So, you know, by 2050, um, what will a bank be? Um, will it be, you know, just a, a store of data? Um, will a bank want to give up the interface to the customer? Um, you know, if banks agree and, and they do want to give up the interface to the customer, then maybe um, the fintech, you know, the new banking channels um, can merge that innovation um, with um, the trust that, that, the, that the legacy banks have um, and, in a sense, um, overtake them. I think by 2050 and 30 years' time, um, the whole idea of um, what a bank is and what a fintech is and what financial services is and, and what we demand as customers, what we need, what our requirements are, um, could be so completely different um, that, you know, it's astonishing the amount that's changed and that, you know, mobile banking, app banking is about 10 years old, internet banking is about 20 years old. Um, in 30 years time, um, do we think we'll be having this debate about, you know, will fintechs overtake the banks? Um, will it be, you know, are fintechs going to overtake the um, biological, um, you know, implanted financial service ecosystem providers in the market? And I think Sagar, Sag, Sag, I'll be interested to get your view on this from a, from a, from a Saudi perspective, fintech, obviously big push in the kingdom. What's your view in 2050? Do you think um, <laughs> there's going to be a new start fintech that's taken over BSF or Al Raji Bank or Samba? And, and, uh, and we, we're, we're paled into insignificance by that point. I, I think if the, the ambitions for the kingdom are vision 2030, and, and, and that's been a very clear sort of goal for a lot of the government organizations and large institutions over the last five years. And I think vision 2030 is, is still very much a target. And, and a lot of those targets have already been met already um, because of innovation, because of drive towards that. When we look at 2050, I, I think we're, we're, we're talking about a completely different ball game. I, I agree with some of the points which uh, Simon and Ben have said. My view is what will value look like in 2050? If, you, if, you, if we, it, one thing which I've always been very excited about is Moore's law and the doubling of technology, I think it's every two years. If we continue that trend um, and that innovation trend happening, we will hit a point where machines, robots, artificial intelligence is smarter than human beings. And then that, that point, um, I think, has been referred to as the technology singularity. It's the point where machines are actually more smarter. They, take, they, they can do a lot more things better than human beings can. Originally, I think that point was thought to be around 2030, but, more, but later, current evidence suggests it might be around 2040, 2050. If we assume by 2050 we're in a position where we have machines which are smarter than uh, humans and we're not in a Terminator scenario, so we're not trying to kill off all the machines, then we've got to think about, well, what, what are all the humans going to be doing with their spare time? What's going to be driving them? Because then that will then determine what they consider as creating value, can consider as storing value. If by that point you've got machines covering everything um, and essentially you've got a, some sort of universal basic income system where the, the, the state or whatever the state is called at that point is looking after the, um, looking after the individuals and giving them some pocket money to actually go and spend how they want to spend it, then, then I think your banking infrastructure is, is, is very, very different to how it would be right now. It's, 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 it's still there. There's still a requirement for some sort of wealth, uh, well, wealth storage. But what's the ambition for humans in 2050 if, if wealth, wealth creation is no longer the ambition because machines are doing all the wealth creation? What, do, do we sort of enter a new renaissance period where we uh, read and write and art and, and all those sorts of things take over? So I think that's where I see the, 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 this discussion when we get to uh, 2050, because, one, it, because understanding the human mindset there is, 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 is an incredible, incredibly difficult task. Once we get to that, once we understand that, then we can work back towards to what would we think of as banking? Uh, yeah, and that's probably a good segue actually to 
another question which I had, and it actually brings up the relevance of this, because the world may have changed. The, the, the way we see banking just now is going to be in a totally different stratosphere. And, and so the question was, and I'm going, to, I'm going to get Abdul Rahman and you to kind of maybe have an initial pass at this, then we'll go back around the group. But ultimately, will everyone be banked in 2050? So to Sagar's point, are banks still relevant in 2050? Or is there a totally new paradigm in terms of how people manage their wealth or manage their lives? And banks have literally morphed into a different shape. Great question. I think, thank you, Grant, for that. And I, <clears throat> I think for me, I fall somewhere in between. I see a, a bit of two extremes between uh, Sagar and uh, Ben and Simon. And I think one, one key area is what, is, what are the demographics going to look like in uh, 2050? And keep in mind, essentially, in 2050, right now, all the wealth is essentially, or you know, the majority of our wealth is held with, of course, older generations who have typically banked, you know, when things were more traditional, paperwork involved, and so on. I think going forward, you're going to have the wealth shift more towards millennial, Gen Z, and then, you know, even younger generations. And there, you're going to start to see people who have never used, you know, something manual. We've all, you know, we're all growing up now in a time when things are very frictionless. And I think that this will be the key sort of driver for how how banks evolve and how people look at banks. I think going forward, as a from a generation perspective, I think things will definitely be a lot less, you know, frictionless. And essentially, what's going to happen is you're going to find a big portion of the population is going to be willing to embrace those new fintechs and banks will just become maybe things held by government or you know organizations that are just keep, keeping tabs on the underlying economy but you know actual banking day-to-day -day banking operations in the traditional term will not be happening the same way they are today that's how i see it and mainly just because of this generational shift and the difference in lifestyles essentially with a new generation and more advanced, let's say, or more technologically uh, uh, enabled generations uh, taking ownership of uh, of this new wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting. Other one, I, th I think the key thing to ask is what, what will it mean to be banked um, in in thirty years' time? You know, what what, what will what will banking be? And you know, even today, it's it's very possible to not be banked, not just because. Um, you don't have access to participate, but because you make a, you know, a choice not to be banked. Um, so whether, you know, it's some of the, the kind of um, more technical crypto stuff that, that I know Simon knows a lot about, or whether that's just because actually you want to, you know, manage your finances on a prepaid card, you want to take your, you know, you borrow your finances for your, for your home from a, you know, directly from a mortgage lender and not from a bank. So it is possible even today through a couple of business models to not be banked. Um, so I think I think the big question is what will what will it mean to be banked in 2050, um, given that um, you know you currently don't have to be banked. Um, do I think everybody in 2050 will have access to um, should they choose um, digital financial services? Absolutely. Um, what form will that take? Um, I'm not sure, but maybe maybe Simon, you can shed some of your kind of views and research on you know the future of um, you know cryptocurrency being off the grid, etc. Yeah, so before I come on to crypto, I, I do think that people view fintech itself through the lens that they understand it to be. So if I only use PayPal to move money, then all PayPal does is move money. Well, actually, no, it does a lot of buy now, pay later lending. It lends to small businesses. They actually do an awful lot of lending, and that's market funded lending. Um, and that's a big driver of their of their revenues. And, tip, and same with Square, they, they do a massive amount of lending. And so uh, if you think about the function of what a bank did historically, it was to maturity transformation, take deposits and lend over the longer term horizon. Actually, that can be done without a bank reasonably effectively. The, what do I actually need a bank for anymore? Well, I need it to access certain financial rails. And they are quite good at managing risks across a diversified balance sheet. So what role will that play in the future, I think, is, a, is an interesting question. And then what are the assets we're using as we move to a more globalized world, even, yes, intense trading times? Um, as you introduce things like um, cryptocurrencies, you start to wonder, what does a global citizen hold? What do they do? Is there a sort of US dollar that we all start to use that's a token? Do we use something else? Um, as the trade wars intensify and as there is less of a, a global world order, you know, what does that person that um, works in one country, lives in another one and has family somewhere else, wh what are they using day to day? Are they using a bank or are they using another service? 
So I do think that the, what the consumer sees and the rails are really starting to change. Um, the role that banks have played historically has not just been to serve the serve the economy with lending, but they also work very closely with policymakers and regulators around helping manage um, the flow of money through society, helping manage policy, helping understand how to, to grow the economy. That is still an extremely valuable role. And working with large corporates and working with um, sovereign wealth funds, there's a lot of room, I think, still in that space to for banks to really carve out what the future is. But thinking about how they enable others is going to be really key, whether that rail is crypto, whether that rail is a new um, payments platform, whether it's a central bank issued digital currency, you know, it almost doesn't matter what the rails become. What are banks really great at? You know, when they, when if everybody else could do technology better than you, what would you still do? And I think that's an interesting question to think about as you uh, as you um, ponder strategies. Yeah, I think I think something a lot of people would say that the um, you know the thing that banks do, you know, more so than than the, some of the other players in the financial services ecosystem is, you know, security and trust. Um, you know, that's why we we deposit our funds with them. That's why we borrow from them. Um, what, what do you think happens in, in that world where actually, you know, you have smart contracts, um, all of your transactions are on the blockchain um, and, you know, the, the government therefore probably will stop, um, you know, using the banks as their, their kind of go to um, advisors for fiscal policy and instead go to these new um, these new fintechs or these new token um, owners of cedars um, to kind of understand how their smart contracts work, how the blockchain is flowing around the ecosystem and how that can be manipulated or managed or controlled. So I think we're already seeing that with big tech, especially in China. Um, the, it was interesting that the IPO for um, Alipay has been pulled and, and Amp Financial. Uh, and I think part of the reason is that tension playing out. There was a good report by the Bank of International Settlements looking at big tech lending. And uh, the, the, I think big techs have deployed at more than 800 billion in lending. Uh, now that's an originate to distribute model. So what they're doing is they are originating the lending and then distributing it to other banks. They're getting much more of the cut. The bank, the smaller banks are doing really well. The bigger banks are struggling because they didn't position themselves to partner. So that's an interesting model where uh, if you go do a study of consumer surveys about who do you trust to hold your money, the answer is always a bank. But it's kind of like asking, who do you trust to catch bad people? Well, the answer will always be the police. There is this consumer utilitarian mindset about what certain things are for, and the bank is where money goes. Uh, you talk that from uh, when you're a child. But then if somebody comes along with a better product, you, you just use it. Nobody ever asked for a car. They were just wanted faster horses. So consumers are very, very bad at predicting what they actually want. Um, th so the consumer surveys that you see where consumers trust banks more, it's like, cool, they understand banks more too. So the, of course they trust them more because it's what they know. But early adopters and then the early majority will actually try something new. And we've seen this with every wave of technology that's come along. The first person to get the mobile phone may not have been the person that was like, oh, no, I don't need it. I've got a telephone in my house or you know, I like speaking to people first, face to face. Now everybody has a mobile phone. Waves of technology change do, do come like that. So we're already seeing the consumer interface change and we're already seeing the regulators start to start to react differently as a result. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, China as well is they have the um, Digital Currency Electronic Payment Initiative, DCEP, which is a direct response to too much big tech lending and payments activity that they don't feel they have oversight over. So what the Chinese government has done is built its own sort of digital first currency that can move almost independently of the banks. And it's, it's like physical notes and coins that would fit in your physical wallet or, or in your pocket. These are digital um, renminbi, digital Chinese currency that you can send peer to peer through different apps. Now, isn't that interesting that the Chinese state has done that and believes that it will lead to waves of financial inclusion um, that build on what we've seen from the big techs? It almost reminds me of the um, of the railroad companies in the 1800s when there were lots of different railroad companies, they all competed with each other. And what you saw in major cities was that there would be 10 different train stations of which you could go to the same places. And sometimes the rail tracks would compete with each other and it was wildly inefficient. 
turns out for things like critical national infrastructure, sometimes it's helpful to have an organizing principle. So in a weird way, there is an outcome in which crypto and blockchain becomes a lot more centralized for some cultures in some parts of the world. In other parts of the world, you have a hi different historical precedent. So with, uh, I think about Visa, I think about Swift, you know, Visa starts as Bank America, and it's a simple way of moving money for one bank. And actually, it starts to catch on, and then the Discover card comes, and a few other things start to emerge. And the government in the US, instead of saying, well, we're going to build our own that competes with you, simply said, huh, that's interesting. Uh, we'll work with you, we'll regulate you, and we'll make you legitimate. And I suspect that's where crypto may be going more from the US and the European side, which is to say, hey, this is a market innovation. How do we protect users given this market innovation? And if the consumer is getting um, financial services, if they have access to credit, uh, if we're able to meet our policy objections, we care how the technology works. I think there was a commenter that I did say, uh, did see put, put up the Bill Gates quote about uh, people need financial services, but not banks. Great job commenter, because that's absolutely true. And just to throw it in there as well, Simon, and I think this, this theme of um, financial infrastructure and even, even the, the, the crypto network that's, that's kind of um, building momentum globally is, and a lot of people like, like crypto because they feel it's, it's untraceable, that they, they're not in the financial system. And there was a lovely quote from a friend um, I was chatting to the other day. It's, it's the watched and the unwatched, the tracked and the untraceable. Um, in terms of the, the global economy. And by 2050, will we have a huge swathe of the population who's actually moved away from um, technology and the traditional systems that we operate in now because they don't want to be part of it. They've almost been flooded out with bureaucracy, regulation, um, being watched in terms of government states. And I think this is an interesting, I guess, segue to kind of maybe to get some views on this before we move to the next point. What are, your, what are your thoughts around this? Do you think it will go to a different extreme from where we are now? We'll have Can two I just pick up on that briefly before society? throwing everybody else around? Just because I, I think it links on from the last point, which is you know, big tech is now so pervasive. Um, and we really are starting to see the bit of a tech backlash um, that started to come and people pushing back against uh, having adverts sold on them and, and kind of the all seeing, all knowing. And it's convenient, but at what cost? And, and where does that sort of little bit of personal space start to start to come into it? And indeed, there are now in 2020 people who live entirely off grid and they have been for some time, but digitally. So they live in crypto, they're paid in crypto, their entire a, economy uh, and life sustains perfectly happy and functions in crypto. Uh, I do suspect by 2050 that movement is bigger and we may even see our first nation states that are run entirely independent or, or declared with the UN um, that, that run that sort of way because uh, why can I not have an online country and online citizenship? Estonia has created something called e-residency, the idea that I can be a resident of that country and never visit. Uh, and so what does that look like for a digitally native economy? Um, interesting questions to play with, and I'll, uh, I'll stop talking now because I've talked a lot. No, Indeed. no, this, this Simon, is a, obviously a really interesting theme for lots of reasons. Well, one of the things that, you know, when I was thinking what, what will banking look like in 2050 is, well, actually, you know, there could be the death of the nation states by 2050. You know, the idea that most of the flows of information, of knowledge, of wealth, um, you know, around the world uh, are no longer constrained by borders. Um, so, so I think I completely agree um, that you might see some of those cases. However, what I think is a much more likely scenario in 2050, um, I, think, I think the segment you're talking about, you know, the off-grid, um, the purists, the people who will be using their own um, financial services ecosystem, if you like, and therefore in some sense um, are just creating another problem. Um, but I think what's more likely is this terrifying notion of bed-to-bed -bed banking, um, which is something that I, I, I like to use, which is, you know, uh, you wake up in the morning and your Alexa or your Google Home um, knows what time your alarm is. They know what your heart rate has been throughout the night. Um, so they know, um, you know, whether you need this for breakfast or which coffee to order. They know what time you book your Uber into work. Therefore, they know, um, you know, what time that your lunch should be there. They know um, how your heart rate is for the day. So they should understand whether they should serve you an offer through their bank. Um, they know that they should probably increase your interest rate during a certain time of the year because they can sense through your, your motions or whether you're stressed or whether you're having a poor night's sleep, um, you know, whether they can uh, win loyalty and, uh, by rewarding you and, and, and you know, increase 
um, the acquisition of, of their deposits. Um, then they know what time you have lunch because you order it through the app that's all connected. They know when you book a holiday, they know which airline you use. They then try and sell you through the open banking framework um, all of the, the options that they have. And so there's a kind of singularity and in, in, you know, reduces competitiveness in financial services, but also in um, other types of commerce. Then they know when you go home, they know how many children you have, they know how healthy you are, they know when you exercise, and they know what car you drive, um, they know how much savings you have in each of your, they know the types of things that you like to invest in, and then you go to bed, and then it starts all over again. Um, and I think that's a more likely scenario, and it, it's a more terrifying scenario, and we're, we're already seeing this, of course, you know, with the way that people are connecting their lives through smart homes, smart fridges, um, smart everything, uh, smart kettles. People know when you, you, know, you boil the kettle to have a cup of tea now. So they know exactly the right moment to sell you, you know, a life insurance policy. Um, I think you know, that, that is more likely than the, the kind of off the grid new establishment of um, you know, these, these niche blockchain driven societies. I think it's terrifying. And I think the reason I think it's terrifying is um, because of fairness, because of financial inclusion, um, because if, you know, um, all financial products and services are, are based off your individual behavior, um, then certain people um, are going to be treated unfairly. Um, so, so that, I think, Simon, is, um, you know, a more likely scenario. And it's something that fills me with dread. And uh, this notion of bed-to-bed -bed banking is exactly what I think, you know, the super tankers, Amazon, Google, um, they're trying to create. And, you know, banks, I think, um, need to start behaving like um, Amazon or Google or Amazon and Google are going to start behaving like banks. Uh, and that's something that we're already seeing. But I think, I think just, just to add to that, Ben, I think um, I, I agree with you that it can be terrifying, your, your scenario. I, I actually think your scenario is what will, will, is more likely to play out um, unless the technology leads to greater equality. So the technology actually understands the different levels of inequality and therefore and it helps to standardize the level of quality so everyone has a better life at the end of it. Well, one thing I just wanted to add was, and, and this might be a little bit controversial with three bankers on the panel, is bank, banking is a chore. Um, I don't, I never enjoy banking. I never enjoy going onto my banking app and having to pay someone. I never enjoy having to go um, and speak to my bank about uh, trying to add a new payment recipient on there. I enjoy going on Netflix. I enjoy going to the gym. I enjoy socializing with my friends. And if um, you, you, the scenario which you're creating where banking solutions are sort of embedded into my everyday life, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because I, I don't, therefore do not need to worry about these chores which I don't like doing. And I've, it frees up my time for doing things which I do enjoy doing. There's yeah, a balance. There's a, ba well. there's a balance. If you just, <laughs> yeah, if you just allow me to give, yeah, just a quick point, and I agree with Sagar and, and Ben, uh, but I think also maybe taking out the element of actual, so when you look at like internet of things, I don't think we're gonna have things anymore. I think it'll be, everything's just gonna be embedded within uh, our environment. You're not really gonna need an Alexa, you're not gonna need a HomePod to, uh, to serve you. And that way as well, I think it'll be a lot more difficult to try to go off grid things again. And I think an enduring uh, trend that we've been seeing is just you know the, the decrease in friction and essentially what you're looking at is okay if i have you know if everything is really frictionless things are being tracked all the time and you don't really need to interact with anything directly to do your day-to-day -day banking which i agree with sagar is more like it sure these days i think definitely it'll be a very challenging prospect for someone to be off grid or because again i imagine internet just being universal everywhere you are wherever you are in the world even if you're on a remote island you'd still be covered by some kind of satellite and then you know, you'd, you'd still be connected. So uh, yeah, that's what I see. Thank you. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly segue the topic now onto thinking bigger beyond banking and then looking back towards the, the banking sector and how some of these other factors play in by 2050. So I think, I want, and I'd like each one of you to just give an initial view on this and then we can then maybe have a, a broader conversation. We're going to have we're going to have about 10 more minutes of discussion in this group, and then we're going to go back to taking some questions that are coming through from the, from the, the wider audience. So, so we'll give, give everyone a chance to ask some questions to um, hopefully get some feedback from us all. So what are the biggest changes outside of banking that ultimately are going to influence banking in 2050? So I'm going to start, Abdul Rahman, I'm going to start with you first, and then we'll go around the group. Biggest changes, changes. Out, of out of banking. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So, uh, 
I think for me, some of the, the biggest changes, like I said before, is removing things. I think also essentially look at how we're going more towards a demand economy. You get things on the spot, you order food. Do you then in the future need refrigerators anymore? Or will you just be able to get cold water whenever you need, you know, you need a glass of water? So, you know, these kinds of like uh, delivery mechanisms, I, uh, I can't imagine maybe at the moment how this is going to happen, but I'm sure there's going to be a way where you always have a drone nearby that can just give you something or not necessarily a drone, but something that resembles it. And I think this is, this is one of the key changes. So things will just become a lot more accessible. People won't really need to worry so much about, you know, uh, access to uh, goods and services. I think also as well, in terms of just the, the generational shift, I think people, of course, will live a lot longer and, and healthier lives. And of course, this will also uh, change a lot of the ambition and, you know, so for example, you could work until you're, you know, 50, 60 years old and then, you know, you still have 30 years left of, you know, good health where you can actually go and live your life and then, you know, what are the, uh, what kind of entertainments we're going to have, what kind of experiences we're going to have will also sort of be a big driver because of course, you know, you, you spend more, of course, on leisure and if you have that ability, you have a longer lifespan you would definitely then consume a lot more. And I think this is a, this is a key challenge. Now, for me, the other, just on the, on the other side is, okay, how habitable will our, will our world be? Will we still have, you know, all these natural areas and like, you know, uh, places where you can just go where the environment is really clear and you can have some fresh air and so on. This, is, this for me is a big question mark. And I really hope that this turns out to be the case. That would be the best case scenario. But of course, unfortunately, the more we, rely on technology and new kinds of trends. Sometimes it comes to the expense of our planet. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that for me is the only questionable area where will we be able to really maintain our planet and continue to live in a healthy way? We're so, going to come back to that one because that's a hot topic. <laughs> again. Um, Simon, what, what are your thoughts? What, what's the, the biggest changes outside of banking? Yeah, I think it's that one. It's, it's the nature of an aging population and a dying planet. Um, like, can we reverse that trend or not? Because if we can't, then we're going to see more political instability as nations fight for less resource with an increasing population and an aging population. If the population continues to age, you also see less people of working age that can maintain social welfare systems that have been the bedrock of many of the developed economies historically. So you fundamentally have to reshape the social contract between the citizen and the state. And the confidence in the state is limited. So you see a rush to authoritarianism. And we've already seen that. Now, how do you how do you reverse that? The political will to really reverse that has been extremely limited. Uh, in fact, weirdly, the authoritarian states have been far better at doing it than the, the more democratic ones, which says democracy itself um, could be a threat in many parts of the world. Um, because the, the, the states that are, have got their act together are also the authoritarian ones. The, um, to a lesser extent, maybe some of the European ones. But I think about China's movements into um, sustainable and impact and climate in the past 10 years, and it's been phenomenal. When they move, they really, really move. Um, so the opportunity to do that. So how that impacts financial services day to day is going to be really, really interesting. Um, and do we see this increasing binary of haves and have nots? Um, driven by monetary easing in the um, major developed economies, because that monetary easing is driven by the fact that those economies are less productive. Those economies are less productive because their population is aging. And does that trend continue? Or will they reopen Im immigration and actually start to solve that problem temporarily? And will they move to more production economies? And is that even realistic in a globalized world? Um, or will we see protectionism and more of a race to the bottom in a really difficult 20 years? It, it's, it's hard to say. Mm, yeah, I agree. I, I agree, Simon. And uh, what I would say, you know, changes outside banking in the next 30 years, uh, and it kind of connects with, with everything we've said about, you know, throughout this discussion is, I think, I think community will be redefined. What it is to be a participant will be redefined. What a nation state could be redefined. Um, you know, the, the idea of, of participation and values will change. Um, the idea of wealth will change. And, and you know, it, it wouldn't be a panel discussion without mentioning coronavirus this year. Um, and what, what I think, you know, a lot of people may have done during this period is, is, is reassess what's important. You know, maybe spending time with your family is more important than, than working the extra couple of hours. Maybe going on holiday is more important. Um, maybe this, this readjustment of values, and, and maybe that will connect to, you know, I'm an optimist, and maybe that will connect to the way people treat the planet. Um, so I'd like to think, you know, optimistically over the next 30 years, the changes outside of banking 
and will be you know an increased um, emphasis on what it is to be a human an increased emphasis on participating in your local community and enriching your own life um, as much as you possibly can realizing that we are you know we are we are mortal uh, and that you know that we have huge problems that are facing us um, and the way that we can do that um, is through you know new forms of community and participating with each other in in different ways I think so from, for, for me um, I agree with the point we raised around climate change uh, the other two I wanted to mention was artificial intelligence I think that's going to be one of the biggest changes which impact all our lives and the, the way that governments respond to that is going to be um, it is going to impact how we all live in the future whether it's because artificial intelligence will lead to a lot of people not necessarily having a day-to-day -day job and having to find something else to do with their time how the government responds to that in keeping those people comfortable and happy or whether or do they actually start getting more uh, combative and 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 we see more extremism coming in that i think will be an interesting uh, change in trend and the other one is space travel. I think we, we are now seeing the dynamics of space travel developing. Um, I think space travel will be a lot more involved by 2050. I'm, I'm a great Star Trek fan, so I'm, I'm a big Trekkie, but I think, Star, I think, I think space travel will uh, definitely be taking off. And uh, what, what will that mean for the future of, um, future of humanity? If we find out, if, if, if we sort of have a focus, something like space travel to explore um, outside of, uh, outside of um, Earth, then does that unite humanity in a way which we can get united before? I, I don't know, um, but it, I think those are the interesting changes. Do, do, do you think, Scar, and, and I guess to everybody, one of the, you know, do you think this increase in AI, this increase in digitization, uh, this increase probably in, you know, transactions being done um, outside of the, you know, traditional financial services ecosystem will potentially lead to an increase in humanization within financial services and other industries. So, uh, you know, all of our predictions so far have been about, um, we think that there'll be a reduced role for humans in financial services. But actually what we're seeing in, in reality um, is alongside the growth in digital banking, we're seeing an increase in the number of call centers. You know, people still want to, maybe they won't want to deal with customers in branches, and um, maybe branching branch banking is 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 on its way out, and other types of you know in face interaction, uh, face to face interaction. Um, but there's also a parallel humanization that's taking place um, with the growth of these digital technologies. And Ben, just and and we've seen this as part of uh, within BSF some of our own strategy definition and where we're going. It's digital with a human touch. How how do we enable? Um, great services, but actually still keep that intimacy and the human contact. And I think that's that's going to be the big shift change we'll see in coming years. People will be sick of having a chatbot or some AI um, it, it's a led service versus actually engaging with someone. And I think we'll probably see some kind of shift change back to more interaction and engagement in the future. That's certainly something which we're, 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 we're seeing now. And I think um, there's also going to be, in my view, a big push towards um, more sustainable investment and and people being much more aware, both politically, socially, environmentally, in terms of how they actually engage with the financial services community, be that a tech company or be it a bank. And I think that's probably the other big topic. We could probably have a separate discussion around that, around ESG and investments and where will that be in 2050 for banking and investment just now. There's, there, there seems to be a big shift change there. I know Abdul Rahman, you've got a view on that. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get that view before we move on. Um, and then we'll have, um, we'll take some questions from the, the, the wider audience as well. We'll give ourselves a bit of time for that. Great, thank you, Grant. And yeah, I think, I mean, on, on ESG, I think it's a, it's a really interesting topic. And these days, you know, we've moved more from, uh, you know, uh, ESR and uh, the typical way that organizations used to look at uh, social responsibility. And now we're more looking more at the environment, sustainability, and governance itself and I think for me uh, it seems it's definitely going to be a driving factor going forward even for banks and uh, of course the large corporations in general because again of the changing demographics now you know you look at the generations that are coming up now you look at you know uh, children in school these days these are all going to be the you know the wealth holders of the future and now they are being taught how to take care of our planet how to make sure that everything you do is socially responsible is ethical and that, you know, there's this really big emphasis. And also, in addition to that, you also have this, you know, the, the interconnectedness of the whole world and how, again, like, for example, I sit and speak to Ben sometimes uh, in the evening and, we're, you know, we're speaking, we've lived completely different lives. 
but at the same time, just growing up at the same, you know, at the same age where everything is so connected, you, you find that our views are actually kind of similar. You know, we've read the same things, we've been influenced by the same things. And I think this is what will drive ESG in the future. It's already a, a growing trend now and actually fund managers and investors can't find enough companies to invest in, uh, you know, with the, the tick the right boxes when it comes to ESG. And of course, going forward, I think this will really be a key, a key pillar of uh, investing and, you know, choosing it, where to place my money and who do I work with or interact with. That's, that's definitely how I see it. It's, it's really going to be the core of what we do. I, I agree with you, everyone. But I also think that there needs to be a shift in what we perceive as wealth, um, you know, for, for people to, um, you know, chase for in ESG, unless in some way it's um, subsidized or controlled by the government, people are not doing it. And that's because, like the rest of you, we probably have uh, our pension fund in an ETF that, that's tracking, and, and we, we all care about that. I care about that, shamelessly, but I also care about the environment. Um, and I think until there are those large scale um, ESG opportunities, then, you know, at the moment, not, not very many hedge funds are investing you know, huge amounts, not many um, traditional capital markets, um, you know, trading floors are investing in ESG just because there aren't opportunities of the right size. And so I think that type of, um, that type of change will only occur um, if it's led and driven um, by the state. Interesting. Um, I think the consumer poll will make it happen. Um, and you can see this already. For me, ethical is the new luxury. The car everybody wants in most uh, sort of the, the 20 somethings that are writing software or want to buy a Tesla. Um, and now whether or not the production actually produces more carbon than, than some other production methods is completely different to, to whether or not it's desirable. Um, the sustainable uh, luxury good is more valuable than the non-sustainable luxury good. And I think that consumer demand is really, really the poll here. And remember that business leaders and people in government are consumers too. And so that mindset is starting to shift as we realize, oh my goodness, we're actually killing the planet our grandchildren may have to get off the planet. Do we realize that that's like existential? And it's, we're boiling the frog, except it's the 9 billion people. I don't know if you're familiar with the boiling the frog analogy. This is the idea that you put a frog in, hot, in cold water and slowly heat it up. And it never realizes that the water is getting hotter till eventually it dies. That's what we're doing to ourselves. And there is a generation of people for whom that really, really matters. And, and I, I, it's interesting, again, as you look at the West, you're seeing this real diversification and bifurcation of opinions as the as the old world views are either dying out or you know kind of are we are we going to make that shift can can humanity do it we're at a pivotal point in, in our history i think but do you know what's in your pension fund do you know how your funds are invested is it going towards um things that you want it to or not and bringing consumers that transparency not in a way that's sitting with a financial advisor at the end of the year but that's something that they feel and that changes their habits every day I think is a real opportunity that's starting to starting to come into the market. Yeah, I, I agree. So. I think ethical being the new luxury, but also choice is the real luxury. So like the availability of these products and the ability as an individual to have the choice or to be able to participate. Um, so those people who are, you know, writing the code and will aspire to have a Tesla, they can participate in this economy because they are, you know, enfranchised by their level of wealth so they can participate. For you know the vast majority um, of the people in the world, I think they need some kind of um, overarching governing force um, to encourage those behavioural changes. Um, but I think it's going to be a bit of both. Right, I'm going to I'm going to pause you now, and we're going to take. There's a couple of questions coming in from the audience, which I want to get out there because there's some good ones here. We've got, we've got five minutes left before I ask one last question of you all before we wrap up. So. What's our views as a panel around open banking startups by 2050? Where do we think open banking will be? Um, what's the 30 year period going to bring for that kind of new wave of regulation and, and an open infrastructure? I, I think, you know, we won't be talking about open banking in 2050. We'll be talking just about banking. Um, you know, before then, I think we'll be talking about, you know, open everything, um, open payments, open insurance, open retail, open banking. Um, I think it's something that um, is inevitable. I think it prioritizes the needs of the consumer, certainly. Um, I think what we're, what we're currently waiting for is some um, really good use cases um, that, that make sense to the retail customers. And we're starting to see some of those in, um, certainly in Europe at the moment, um, and some in the Middle East, um, the likes of GetChip or the likes of Plum. 
Um, and these are real kind of understandable open banking use cases that, that you know, banks are going to start um, pushing these towards their customers. So um, I, I think in 2050, we won't be talking about open banking. I think it's going to be a fact of the, you know, the financial services ecosystem. And I think it's going to be a fact of what it, what it is to be bank or to be, you know, to, to be a customer um, of a financial services institution. So Ben, that's back to my point around the theme of connected. We'll, we will open banking will just move into we are connected we've got ecosystems of different providers organizations humans people corporations all linked up through an infrastructure that allows us to, to transact to engage in a service so as a theme i think another question here for you so I'll, i'm quick firing these now but just to manage our time why china is by far advanced in fintech field ai etc although the population isn't that early that an early adopter of innovation and the population is more concentrated in rural areas. What's the view of the panel on that? I mean, China's the fintech Galapagos, right? It was going through a once in a generation shift in its economy. Uh, it had a lot less infrastructure, uh, it had a growing middle class like we've never seen, not even the US at the turn of the century, and the mobile phone had arrived, uh, and cloud had arrived. So why bother trying to put in all the plumbing that we have everywhere else when you can just skip a generation and solve customer problems? And it turns out when you skip a generation and solve customer problems first, you don't end up with the model that you have everywhere else. So it, it, it's gonna be hard to replicate, but also they, they got this advantage and to me, they're the, the country to learn from. Okay, good, good response. I've got another one here. So many of these 2050 predictions sound plausible and likely, Globally, however, do we think that the infrastructure is in place across the planet to be able to have a full connectivity and embedded finance? For example, will a remote place in South Asia have enough bandwidth to manage some of this technology? Great, I'll, I'll take that one. And I think, I, I think honestly, for, for sure, yes. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I think now when we're looking at, uh, I forgot its name, is it Starlink, the new... Uh, the new satellite system that's going up to sort of uh, to, to provide internet connectivity to remote areas in Africa. I think you know these these kinds of services and these kinds of solutions provided by uh, companies these days, and even by the government. I know the UK government is now going and buying these uh, connectivity or internet satellites. And essentially, this is how we're not really going to need infrastructure. You're not going to have to go and do groundwork and like build a telephone, uh, uh, you know, with cables or like. Uh, mobile towers and so on, you're just going to, you know, re rely on a whole network of satellites that cover Earth wherever you are, even if you're on the poles, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're going to have connectivity. And I think this is already happening today. So by 2050, I, uh, I would personally say I'm confident that this will just be something of the past. Okay, right. We're on the hour now. So we, we had one hour. I'm going to ask one last question. And this is a quick fire, literally close out now. And it's a quirky one just to end the evening. So if the phrase of 2020 is you're on mute, what will the phrase of 2050 be? And I'll direct this around the group. Maybe Simon, I know you've got to drop off for another session now, so maybe you go first. Yeah, um, sorry, I lost you in the signal there. I know it's uh, bad weather on Mars today. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Simon. Ben, over to you. Um, I think it will be, it's hot in here. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Yeah, Zach, Ben. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say, oh, I, I can't think of something as creative as those. I'm going to say, what am I going to draw today? Because I don't think they'll be doing anything else other than drawing and reading in 2050. Abdul Ooh. So I guess uh, for me, it'll be, uh, it'll be something like, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, I need my uh, what I, <laughs> I need my spaceship right now or something like that, you know, something really crazy about space travel. But honestly, to tell you the truth, I did I did get this question early on and I, I really couldn't come up with anything because just because of this year and how crazy it was, I just thought, you know, I'm not even going to bother trying to think of something because it's definitely going to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put that on, on my my prediction is stay inside. <laughs> oh, <laughs> So, look, we need more optimism here. <laughs> uh, a more optimistic one would be: Can you just stream me a token? So, I, I do, I do believe that we're we're just going to be streaming payment tokens. There's going to be a very different way to how we actually transact. 
So, um, but look, thank you all. Um, it's been a, an interesting debate. I think we could go on for another hour, um, but everyone's got their evenings to go to. It's certainly been a pleasure to, to moderate this. So thank you, Ben, Abdul Rahman, um, Simon and Saga. Thank you all. And thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to doing this another time round for, for next year's FinTech Saudi tour. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And thank you very much uh, to BCBSF for um, hosting such a great panel and discussion. Uh, every, uh, we've still got another week of uh, FinTech tour happening as well. So if anybody wants to hear some great speakers like we have had today, uh, then feel free to register on uh, FinTech Saudi's website for next week's sessions. Um, and uh, what I've got to say is that enjoy your weekend. Have a great weekend and, and we'll catch up um, next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Take care.